we're going to go over now um, buying automobiles. And when we look at buying automobiles, we're really looking at the exact same process to buy a car is to buy any item. You'll go through the same mental process to buy a candy bar, as you will a TV, as you will a car or a house. And two big considerations when we're going through any of this purchasing process that we're going to go through. One is how expensive the item is. Certainly we're going to spend a lot of time on something that costs us $10,000 to make sure we make a good decision versus something that just costs a dollar. But even more important than that, what we want to look at is what is the cost of failure? How much does it cost us if we make a wrong decision? If there's very little cost to a wrong decision, then we're going to spend very little time on that item. So the simplest would be, I'm trying to decide between a Snicker bar and Twix. Snicker bar and Twix, and they cost a dollar. And so usually the solution to this problem is you just buy them both. That's the obvious solution. But if you can only get one, so I go ahead and I buy the Snicker bar. And you know what? I take a couple bites of it, and I figure, ah, shoot, I should have got the Twix. Um, what have you really lost? Really nothing, right? Because you're going to enjoy the Snicker bar. You would have enjoyed the Twix a little more, but not much, so it doesn't really matter. If we're buying something larger, like, say, a big screen TV, I'm going to buy a 65-inch TV for my house. The cost of failure is certainly a lot higher. I'm going to get a big 65-inch TV that might run me, say, 3500 bucks or something around that. Um, but if I buy a TV that's too big for the room, the focal point might be well beyond the back wall here, which means when I sit, the picture is going to be pixelated. I'm going to see ghost images. It's not going to work well. Or maybe it's too small. Or maybe I went ahead and bought a TV that has a great sound bar that cost me $750, but I'm hooking it up to an external Bose system anyways, so I just lost $750. So we want to go through and make sure we make those good decisions because if I bought the wrong TV for $3,500 and then decided I got to get something else, you know what? I bought a plasma TV which works better in, in brighter light, and I really should get an LC TV because I want to watch the thing with all the lights off in the house. So if you make that wrong decision, and I've had this TV for four or five months, probably best case scenario is I'm selling it for $2,000, maybe $2,500 if I'm lucky. So the cost of failure here is $1,500. Bucks. If I'm buying an automobile and I buy the wrong car, then I pay $25,000 for it. I drive it a couple months. The tires got dirty. If I turn around and have to sell that and buy a different car, I'm going to lose five or $6,000 on that transaction. So we want to spend time and do this um, accurately. There's also a seasonality to an awful lot of purchase decisions. If we're trying to buy cars, typically a brand new car, the best time to buy that car is in October. Items are discounted. The new model years have been out for a while. Nobody wants to sit on, say, a 2013 model in 2014. It's going to lose too much money. So you can tend to get some really good deals, new cars in October. Used cars, February, tend to be some of the best uh, times because the new cars are out in October, November, December, certainly in January, February. And a lot of people are buying new cars. They're dumping their old cars. It's, it's changed over from December to January, so the year has changed, so all the used cars are now a year older in model number. So February tends to be a good time. Even if we look at items like computers, computers have a seasonality to them. And if you're buying a computer, you tend to get the best deals around Christmas and around back to school. So any big ticket item, you'll want to do a little bit of research and figure out, hey, when's the best time to uh, to do this. So if we look at our slide now, what we're going to look at in this um, car purchase is the pre-purchase activities. So the number one item is a problem recognition. And this is true for all purchases. So even if I'm buying a candy bar, my problem is I'm hungry. 
when I'm going to buy a car, typically my problem is my car's broken down, it's too expensive to fix. Um, I just don't like my car and it's had some big repairs, it's about done. Or my car was stolen. And so we're going to do that. We've identified the problem. I need a new car. And now we're going to start gathering information. A lot of the information you're going to gather is from yourself. You are an important part of gathering information. We're going to gather your past experiences. And we're certainly going to gather your preferences. If everybody tells you and you do outside research that a Ford Focus is the best car and that's what you should buy and it's the top selling car right now but you just don't like that car then you shouldn't buy that car if you don't like it so we're gonna do that research one of my friends owns a Honda Accord and she loves her Honda Accord she bought a Honda Accord right out of high school she had that car for 13 years she bought a new Honda Accord and then she's had that for 15 years and now she's buying a new car again and there's no way she's gonna get anything other than a Honda Accord that's just her experience and that's what she's going for that's probably not the best decision I mean at least look at some things but all things being equal and you've had great experience with a product or a car or a design or a style then stick with it so we've done our internal stuff we want to look external also in my opinion, the best source of information is Consumer Reports. Consumer Reports is just a fantastic wealth of knowledge where they survey everybody. They got cars broken down by model type, by drivetrain, uh, certainly make and model. They've got um, repair histories, safety records, and all that on the cars. And so you want to get that Consumer Reports and read about all the different cars that are similar to what you've decided you need. Part of the need recognition is also determining what do I want out of this car. Maybe gas mileage is incredibly important to you because you're driving 50 miles round trip to work. So therefore that's going to be a big factor. Uh, the last car I bought because we needed a truck and it was just going to be driven around town just a little bit and then we we're taking the truck on long trips to uh, camping skiing and stuff like that and so gas mileage was irrelevant for the most part when we were going through that process we wanted something that was going to haul all the stuff that we need was incredibly comfortable on long rides and at the same time we could get through snow and we could do a little bit of off-roading with it if we wanted and so we had a very very different need structure so hopefully you've done that also when we're negotiating for a car here's one of the biggest mistakes that people make in getting a car they're sitting around one day and they say you know what we should buy a car this weekend and they drive out and the first thing they do is they're driving down the street and they see a big sign that says free hot dogs and they go okay let's go there and so they spin the car around they park the car they go in and then seven hours later they walk out with a car that is one of the worst things that you could do because you're basically playing their game Car dealers and car salespeople are experts at negotiating and they are experts at getting you to buy. And so you have to refuse to play their game. Part of their game is, is to get you there and to cool your jets for hours upon hours upon hours. Because all salespeople know that if you're in that dealership for longer than four hours, the odds of you buying skyrockets. Because, man, you know, I don't want to spend six hours at this car dealership, not buy a car, and then turn around, go to another auto dealership, and spend six hours at the next auto dealership. And they know that. And so you have to refuse to play that game. If you're going to go into a car dealership, you've done your research, you've narrowed it down for maybe 15 cars you saw on Consumer Reports and now we just want to test drive a car you go on to the dealership 
and say, hey, you know what, I want to test drive the Ford Focus. Very first question you're going to get, what color? And you go, doesn't matter, I'm just here to test drive it. Well, how much can you afford? Well, I can afford this car. I'm looking at six or seven different cars. I have 20 minutes and I would like to test drive a Ford Focus or the Nissan Maxima or an Altima or whatever the car happens to be and say, you know, if we can't do this in 20 minutes, I'll just come back at a later time or I'll go to another dealership. Guarantee you they'll be able to get you a test drive in and out that door in 20 minutes. And that's what we're looking for. So you're in and out in 20 minutes, you've test drive six or seven cars, and now you're starting to hone in on maybe the two or three or even just one that you really like. The next step, I think one of the most important things is you can buy specific reports from Consumer Reports, they're about seven or $10, that goes through everything about the vehicle, how much the vehicle's invoice cost is, cost of options, um, ownership satisfactions, all that information is great information to have. And it's like between seven and $10. And if you're gonna spend $25,000 on a car, another 10 bucks isn't very much at all. Hopefully then when we go in to negotiate for this car, we're gonna go there with a lot of information. We've test drove a lot of cars. We know the advantages and disadvantages of all the different cars. And now I want to start talking price a little bit. So we go into the dealer, we sit down, we meet the uh, salesperson, maybe we test drove a car with him before, maybe not. And we sit down and the first thing that they're going to ask you is, how much per month can you afford? Two things. A, just because you can afford to spend $800 a month on a car, doesn't mean you should spend $800 a month on a car. You don't want to make yourself so poor that everything goes into the car and now I can't go to the movies, I can't eat out, I can't do this, I've got huge insurance payments, all going to the car. You want to get a car that satisfies everything you need and certainly do not want to overspend. When they ask you how much you want to spend per month, there's a lot of moving parts to a payment. There's number of years, there's interest rates, if you're leasing, there's capitalization rates, and so you don't want to play that game. What you want to do is you want to talk price of the vehicle plus tax and license. You don't negotiate on price. Once you strike a deal for the cost of the vehicle, then you'll look into financing for a couple reasons. One, hopefully you've already gone into your bank or you've gone into your credit union and you've said, hey, I'm thinking of buying a new car, what are the interest rates? And they'll give you the interest rates, maybe 4%, 6%, 9%, whatever it happens to be, depending on your credit rating. So when you go into the dealership and they say, hey, we got great financing for you at 6.9%, say, well, I don't need financing from you because I'm financing through my credit union at 4%. So therefore, talking payment is just going to confuse everything that's going on. We want to just talk how much is the car plus tax and license. Taxes and license, they don't uh, control. So we talk a little bit, and usually you want the salesperson to make the first offer. You know, it's like, well, what kind of deal can you get me on this? Um, and then he'll say, well, how much do you want to spend? You know, well, I don't know, what's your best price? And they'll come back, I don't know, what's the most you'll spend? And usually at that point I say, well, I'd really like to spend about a dollar on this car, you know, if that works. You want them to set the first price. Say it's a $26,000 car, you want them to come back and say, well, maybe I can do this for $25,200. You want to set those parameters. Or maybe that's a model that's not very popular and it's a $25,000 car and their first offer to you is going to be $21,000. You didn't want to be the person to speak first and say, well, how does $23,000 sound? Because now you're above where their first offer is going to be. You want to hear their first offer first. An awful lot of times what also happens is when we're in there 
And this is them trying to play the game to get you there for a long time. You're there, you sit down, you chat a little bit, maybe you throw an offer out there of $18,000, and the sales guy says, okay, I'll be right back, I'm gonna go talk to my sales manager. And also usually at this point, the salesperson talks to you and says, you know, I really like you, I think you're a great person, you've got like the greatest family in the world, I'm gonna work hard for you. But my sales manager is a big jerk and we gotta try to get a good deal through the sales manager. That isn't what's going on. The salesperson basically is playing a tactical game where they're trying to make it seem like you and him are friends, they're on your side, and you have to work against the evil sales manager, which doesn't exist. Um, the salesperson is there to sell you a car and make the most commission they possibly can. So when he goes back to check price on your offer of say $18,000 and talk to the sales manager, he's just gonna sit back there checking his Facebook, texting friends, talking about vacation, uh, watching something on Netflix for 20 minutes, because they want you to sit there for 20, 25 minutes waiting. Because once again, they know if they can keep you there for four hours, the odds of you buying skyrockets. So if this happens to you, and it's gonna happen to everybody, if you're sitting there at a desk, grab a post-it note off the desk, grab a pen, and just write them a little note. Said, you know, sorry I couldn't wait. I'm interested in the car. Please give me a call and leave your phone number and walk out of the dealership. Quite frankly, if you haven't walked out of a dealership at least once, if not twice, you are not negotiating well. They expect you to leave. They're just not gonna negotiate real hard unless you've walked out once, if not twice. So you walk out and leave, the salesperson comes back, finds the note, and typically they'll say, oh my gosh, he left. They'll give you a call and say, hey, I, I got that price for you. And you say, okay, what's the price? And the salesperson say, well, I'm sorry, we're not allowed to negotiate price on the phone. I need you to come back in the dealership is they wanna get that clock going again of you sitting in the dealership at least four hours so that the odds of them selling you a car goes way up. And so just refuse to play the game. Okay, you're not allowed to negotiate on the phone? All right, I'll come back in the dealership. I can be in there maybe in three or four days from now. Are you working next Saturday? And the person will go, well, wow, that's a long time. Uh, yeah, but you know, you should try to come in this afternoon. And they'll hang up. About three or four hours later, you'll get a phone call from the salesperson who, who will tell you, you know what, I talked to my sales manager, he said that I could go ahead and give you the price over the phone. Unfortunately, we can't do 18,000, but we might be able to do 21,000. And so now you want to negotiate on the phone because you're much more in control and you're not a captive audience sitting, getting beat on by two or three salespeople. One of the other big considerations when we're in negotiating for this, even before it starts, is you have to determine, are you a good negotiator and do you like negotiating? Personally, I love negotiating. It's, it's a fun game. If you hate negotiating and you don't wanna play the game, then off the bat, you've lost the game. If you're a bad negotiator or you don't wanna negotiate, then bring a friend with you. It is always a good idea to go in with another person at a dealership. It is very hard to gang up on two people and force them into contracts, um, but it's very easy to gang up on a single person. So we, we wanna stay away from that. When I worked at Ford, I worked for Ford Credit. The thing we like seeing walking onto the lot, the second best thing were two 19-year-old girls. And those 19-year-old girls were there 
specifically to show their dad that they could buy a car on their own. And by the time they left, five, six hours later, they paid over sticker price, every single extra, life insurance, gap insurance. They just got totally fleeced because they have no idea what's going on. The thing we like to see most often walk onto the dealer lot would be the 19-year-old guy with his 18-year-old girlfriend because he's going to shop for a new car and the last thing in the world that guy is going to do is admit that he doesn't understand the contract. At the same time, as we get closer in this negotiation, we'll just kind of look at that person and go, well, if you can't afford the car, I understand. And then that 18-year-old guy or 19-year-old guy is going to go, oh, well, I can't let my girlfriend think I can't afford it. So I'm going to say yes, because certainly I can afford that. And they'll sign a contract. And once again, they will significantly have overpaid for the vehicle. So if you don't like negotiations, bring someone with you. I've gone to lots of auto negotiations with my sister. I went with my brother-in-law. Um, I've gone with various other friends. And typically, we would take the tactic that whatever car that they liked, I really didn't like. And so when my brother-in-law was trying to buy a Honda Accord, I spent the whole time saying, well, let's leave, man. Let's go try that Nissan um, Maxima again. I think that's a lot better car for you. Let's at least go test drive it. And then I'm trying to pull him out of the dealership. And so now the dealer, to keep him there, needs to keep lowering the price and lowering the price and lowering the price to keep him there. And it's a game. And if you don't want to play the game, you got to bring someone who's going to play the game for you or you're going to significantly overpay. All right, so hopefully we've gathered all our information. We've negotiated a little bit. Um, We've come up with, you know, some uh, some deals on uh, some some good prices. The last three cars I bought, I have closed the negotiation on the phone. We were a little far apart and did some phone calling, phone calling, phone calling, and I made it known that I wasn't stuck solely on that vehicle. If you get to the point that the other salesperson thinks, I am unwilling to walk away from this car, you have lost the negotiation. They've always got to think you're going to walk away. Whether you're going to walk away for price or whether you're going to walk away because you have a, a different vehicle in mind. So a couple vehicles back, I ended up buying a Chevy Avalanche. Really like that truck quite a bit. But whenever I was in that Chevy dealership, I made it clear to that person I wasn't sure what I wanted to buy, whether I wanted to buy the Chevy Avalanche or the Ford F-150, that it was very close. And those two trucks are actually very, very similar. They got some differences, but they're basically similar product. Um, because I want that person to have to induce me, to have to keep the price. I want them to have to keep reengaging me by giving me lower price, better options, discounted packages, whatever it's going to be. Okay, so let's say that we finally get down to the end. I'm on the phone and I agree to a price. Or you're in the dealership and you agree to the price. The best salesperson in the auto dealership is the finance person. The finance person is the person who figures out the finance and insurance and does all that stuff. So what happens is after you've been there five or six hours, you've had all this tough negotiations, you shake on a deal of how much you're going to pay for the car, and next thing you know, all your adrenaline is down. I'm done. I'm relaxed. My defenses are down. I've got a sugar crash. I'm relaxed. I'm done. Then what they do is they take you from the sales guy and stick you in front of the finance manager who does finance and insurance, who is the best salesperson, and that person's job is to get back everything they just gave away. That's going to be the person who takes the next crack at you to sell you gap insurance. The next person is going to sell you the extended warranty. 
the person who's going to try to sell you the alarm system if you didn't buy it. On average, depending on the type of dealership, the finance guy will add two to four thousand dollars to that contract in add-ons. And it's because they got you when your defenses are down and you're tired. And all you want to do is get this car and go home. So you got to be very vigilant. You also need to keep track of, you know, what are all the agreements that we made? What was the price? And I got that written down. Are they going to give me floor mats? Are they going to give me the cool keychain or license plate frame? All those things. Because when you get with the finance guy and he's got the contract in front of you, the very first thing they're going to ask you to sign and initial is a statement that says something like this. All agreements outside of this written contract, whether they be oral or written, are void. So what they're saying there is that if we got a handshake that I'm going to get free floor mats, or even if they wrote you the offer on a piece of paper and the salesperson slid it across to you and it said, free floor mats, free keychain, and here's your price, if it's not end up typed within that contract, you're out of luck. And so even though you're tired, maybe you've been, you have to read that contract and make sure that everything's in there. A couple things that are going to show up on this contract also, um, which is the dealer trying to recapture money they gave away. There's two big ones. One is what's called the dealer prep fee. The dealer prep fee is typically like $395, $295. Um, it's, for the most part, just a bogus fee. It's so that they can advertise the car at $24,950 and yet still collecting a couple extra hundred bucks on that car. When you were negotiating and you negotiated for the price of the car plus tax and license, you look at that $300 fee or whatever it is and say, I'm not paying the dealer prep fee. We didn't agree to it. The other big fee that they're going to try to get you to pay is the DMV documentation fee, which is different than the licensing fee. Um, your dealer does not have control over licensing and they do not have control over taxes. But the DMV documentation fee that they charge you $300 for is to do all the back office paperwork. And there's been so many lawsuits around that. It even says in parentheses, this is not a fee levied by the state of California or this is not a fee paid to the Department of Motor Vehicles. And when they try to collect that, they say, well, we have to do this for this reason or that. I just say, hey, you know what? Um, you write me a letter saying the Department of Motor Vehicles is making you charge this fee, and I'll pay it. And you know what? They'll turn around and they'll say, well, no, that's not it. And then you argue back and forth you still need to be at the point that you are willing to walk away from this deal. Because if they're charging you an extra five, six, seven hundred dollars in prep fees, get up and walk away. You set a deal for say 19,500 plus tax and license. Now they're trying to charge you, you know, 20,800 plus tax and license. That's not what you agreed to. Walk out. And the last uh, deal that I cut, I walked out on the finance person because that's exactly what they were doing. The salesperson then tries to call me and everybody calls me and say, well, how about we split the difference? I just said, no, we had an agreement. It was this price plus tax and license. We don't need all these junk fees. Get rid of them. And in the end, they did. Um, but you have to be willing to uh, walk away. The other thing I want to talk about here a little bit is extended warranties. Um, you do not have to buy an extended warranty when you buy the car or truck. In fact, I think it is a horrible idea to buy the extended warranty at the time of purchase. Two big reasons. One, you will never be at a bigger disadvantage in the negotiating process than sitting in front of the finance person who's the best salesperson there, you're tired, 
and trying to negotiate a good deal. It's not going to happen. The second thing is, well, I'm going to buy the extended warranty for years four through seven. What if I don't own the car? What if the car gets stolen? The car gets totaled? What if I've got my two-seater Miata and then I fell in love with the woman of my dreams who has two kids and then 18 months later we have triplets? The odds are I'm dumping my Mazda Miata for a minivan or a Suburban or something like that. And so that could easily be three, $4,000 that was just given away. So we don't want to do that. Extended warranties sometimes can be a very good deal. And they tend to be a good deal on vehicles that are problematic. And so if you go to buy the extended warranty, say you got a three-year warranty, you need to buy the extended warranty if you're going to buy it. Um, usually three months before your other warranty ends. And certainly you need to um, do that before you tick over the miles. So if you're warranted for 50,000 miles, you certainly have to buy the extended warranty before you go over 50,000 miles. But when you start contemplating this extended warranty, you're going to take the experience of your car, get consumer reports again, because the magazine costs three bucks, you look up all the reliability ratings of that car, of that style, of that year, of that make, um, even uh, you know what plant it came out of. They'll track reliability rates. If my car's running great and it doesn't have a problem and Consumer Reports says that these are incredibly reliable vehicles, I don't need an extended warranty. I'm not going to spend the money. Almost always, I don't buy an extended warranty. The last extended warranty I bought was, happened to be on the Chevy Avalanche that I got. Loved the truck, runs great, but all the electronics started to get glitchy. And we had two or three electronic problems, and every time you have an electronics problem, it's like $850. And so, we decided we were going to buy the extended warranty. Usually, there's like three different types of warranties. Um, Usually there's kind of a powertrain warranty, which is just like engine, transmission, transaxle, and stuff like that. A lot of times there's what's called the powertrain plus, which is going to include like your water pump, your gas pump, and a few things like that. And then you've got like the bumper to bumper extended warranty, which certainly is going to be the most expensive and include all your electronics. Because I was having electronics problems, I wasn't going to buy the powertrain warranty. That would have been not valuable to me. I'm going to buy the one that included all the electronics. And I'm going to negotiate for that. You also do not have to buy the extended warranty from the dealer you bought the car from. So I called my Chevy guy up and said, hey, bought a car there, you know, almost three years ago. I want to do an extended warranty on that vehicle. How much? And he told me it'd be $5,000. So I go, okay. Got on the internet and just Googled Chevy dealerships, printed out 10 or 15 dealerships, and then I just started dialing. And some dealers said 8,000, some said 5,400, a lot of them said 3,000, and one dealer actually said 1,850, and that they were selling it for $100 over cost. So I called my uh, other dealer and said, hey, you're selling me this for five, I'd like to keep it local, I do my servicing with you, but the Chevy dealer in Long Beach is going to sell this thing to me for $1,850 and you want $5,000. What's up with that? And so he goes back in his books and he said, well, you know, they're selling that at only $100 profit. I'm not sure if I want to sell it at that. And I said, well, you know, hey, I bought the car there, I get it serviced there. If I got an extended warranty, I'm going to service it there still. So why don't you just go ahead and do it for me if you're not too busy right now? And so he shook his head and went, all right, okay, I'll do it. So drove down there and we signed the documents. It took me two and a half, three hours to save $3,000 on that extended warranty. Almost always, leasing a vehicle is a more expensive way to own a car. 
leased vehicles because of the way it's structured and the fact that, that at the end of the uh, payments, you don't own the car, cost you more. But it does do this. It allows you to get into a more expensive car that you truly cannot afford. And so they're very, very appealing. But I completely recommend against them. The only time I think you should lease a vehicle is if you own your own business or it's through a business because the tax write-offs are a lot simpler on leased cars than they are on own cars. Um, and maybe you're a salesperson, and so you want to step up, you want to have a better car, you don't have the capital for that car, but you want to create that image. It's actually part of the marketing of your company or the marketing of yourself as a real estate salesperson, along with the fact that it's a lot easier to write it off your taxes. Okay. All right. Thank you very much.